It's an honor for me to introduce tonight's speaker, whose full title is Lord Stern of Brentford. He's the first holder of the I.G. Patel Chair at the London School of Economics. In addition to various other prestigious academic positions, Lord Stern was Chief Economist at the European Bank for Reconstruction, uh, Reconstruction Development and at the World Bank and the U.K. Treasury. His expertise lies in the areas of development and public finance. During his time at the UK Treasury, he headed the review of the economics of climate change and development, which resulted in publication of the Stern Review, a unique analysis, analysis of the risks of climate change. The global warming issue has been percolating at the fringes of public consciousness for nearly 20 years occasionally penetrating briefly into the mainstream. But in the past two or three years, it has surged to the forefront of public concern. It's barely possible to read an analysis of the key issues in the U.S. presidential election campaign, for instance, without running into mention of global warming. Surely the scientific consensus presented by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, palpable changes in climate such as in the Arctic and changes in weather or weather events that were visible to the average person that may be ascribed in some cases to the warming climate, political leadership in some places, and not in Washington, but at the U.S. state level and other countries, high energy prices and the success of uh, Al Gore's campaign and the inconvenient truth are certainly among the factors that caused this increase in visibility. At the same time, the Stern Report somehow managed to break through all this din that keeps serious issues sometimes from raising in the public consciousness. And it grabbed the attention of policymakers and opinion leaders by reframing the debate over economics of action to reduce emissions. And so, as far as I'm concerned, it earns a place among these other critical factors that have helped levitate the issue and raise it in the public consciousness. So I hope you'll all join me in welcoming Lord Stern. Um, thank you um, for that kind introduction. Um, Thank you all for coming. Um, it's very impressive to see so many of you here at uh, 8 o'clock in the, in the evening, at the beginning of the week. Um, it is nice to see what uh, people at Princeton do for fun. <laughs> um, now, um, I'm going to assume, I hope accurately, that most of you are not economists. Um, the, that is, of course, largely your fault. Um, but uh, what I want to do is to talk about economics. So what I'm going to do is to run through an argument which is quite heavily economics, but try not to surface too much of it. So those of you who are economists, please excuse me. I hope you'll see on the slides I use the um, basic economics behind much of what uh, I say. But I won't dwell on it, and I'll actually try to go fastest through the, um, through the most difficult bits. Um, from the point of view of uh, economics. Uh, just got to maneuver the buttons into the right place here. Um, now, the economics uh, is very, very strongly shaped by the science. I'm not a scientist. I, I did do mathematics as an undergraduate, but that doesn't make me a scientist. Um, and it is remarkable how many economists and lawyers and politicians suddenly become incredibly authoritative scientists when they start to look at uh, this problem. But we came at it as consumers of the science. Given what the science is now uh, telling us, how should we think about economic policy? And we came to the conclusion, which I think comes under what John Cleese would call blindingly obvious, that this is about risk, and it's about very serious allocation and responsib responsibility issues between this generation and future generations and amongst generations at any point in time. 
In other words, it's all about risks and it's all about ethics. And what's embarrassing is that the economists hadn't seen it anywhere nearly strongly enough that way. Not all of them, of course, and uh, you know, the economics profession is not one about which you should generalize. But it hadn't been those two things, the risks and the ethics, hadn't been anything like at the center of the stage to the degree they should have been. And of course, also, it's quite clear, and it's from the, from the most rudimentary inspection of the science, that this is a global issue. It's global in its origins, it's global in its impacts. So pretty obviously, the economics of climate change is about, subtitle here, risks, ethics, and uh, a global deal. So that's what we tried to, uh, tried to write about. So let me, at the risk of um, shocking the scientists with its simplicity, just let me describe the basic steps of the scientific story because that's what underpins the economics. And I'll try and describe it in a way that makes it clear that it does underpin the economics. Um, it starts with people, clearly. Uh, people cause, uh, through their economic and other activities, uh, emissions. And uh, that's the first link in the chain. The emissions, uh, which are a flow, build into a stock. It's a flow-stock problem. And that connection between flow and stock is, of course, quite a complicated one in which carbon cycles and other feedbacks are central. And, of course, the fact that some of these greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide, last for a very long time. Um, but it's basically a flow-stock problem, but the nature of the link between the flow and the stock is quite a complex and difficult one, and one which uh, our understanding of moves over, over time. And then there's a link, next link in the chain is between stock and temperature, and that's the greenhouse effect. It's the stock of greenhouse gases that catches the energy and keeps it in. And the bigger the stock, the more the energy is uh, caught, and the more you have global warming. Um, the next link in the chain is between warming and climate. Um, it's not so much the warming that's the problem. And we, I try to avoid talking about global warming in, in terms of titles. It's about climate change. And most of that is operating through water in some shape or form. Storms, floods, droughts, sea level rise. Of course, the temperature has a direct effect itself and you get heat stress and shortening of um, growing seasons and all kinds of things like that. So it's not only through water, but it's largely through water in some shape or form. So there's a global warming to climate change link. And of course, climate change has its impact on people. So it starts with people and ends in people, but there are these basic links in the logical chain through the science that connects um, uh, actions with um, eventual outcomes. Each one of the steps that I've described occurs with some lag or other, and each one of the steps I've described um, has a great deal of randomness in it. Some genuine randomness and some randomness which is just ignorance. But still, from the point of view of decision making, it's, uh, it's randomness. So you've got a great deal of uncertainty in this at every link in the, uh, in the chain. So I've actually said enough both to say that this is an externality, that's a piece of economic language which says that the action of one person affects the consumption and production possibilities of other people. So it's clearly an externality, but I've already said enough, which is just a simple, sort of very simplistic um, articulation of the, of the story, I've said enough to um, say that this is no ordinary externality. So what I'm going to start with is a story about the case for stabilization. It's the stock that's causing the problem. It's our actions that feed the stock through the process I've described. So one way of thinking about policy is to think about what sort of target stocks should you aim for. And I want to argue that that's a good way to think about policy. Then I'll say something about policy itself. If you get a feel for the kind of stock that you ought to be stabilizing at, how do you actually organize policy that you have some chance of getting there? And then finally, I'll say something about the global deal. So there'll be those three, those three parts. Uh, unfortunately, too much of the economics argument, and I've been guilty of this myself, has focused on the stabilization level, and not enough, in my view, on 
what kind of policies and the design of policy and how do you put a global deal together, what sort of global deal, how do you persuade, how do you sustain, how do you build that global deal. That's something which in the past year has interest me, interested me, well, interested me us when we were writing the report, and there's a lot in the report on that, but it's interested me more and more as I've travelled around over this last year and got much more involved in the policy making process. So I'll try to go as fast as I can through the economics and ethics of the case for stabilisation so that there's some time anyway for um, the story about policy and the, um, uh, the global, global deal. So I've said this is an externality, but I've already said this is no ordinary externality. It's global, it's long term, um, through these uh, lag stories and the flow stock uh, process. Uh, it's highly uncertain and it's potentially very large and irreversible. Now, if you think of what the examples we normally give our students on economic externalities, is things like congestion. That uh, you take your car on the road, it slows down other people, the effect is instantaneous, it's local, and you can understand what's going on. Or you have dirty... I'll give a lot of my examples from London, because those of you who uh, can uh, spot accents will tell immediately that's where I was born and uh, brought up. But London's got a congestion charge as a price mechanism for an externality. We teach in economics, if people don't pay for the cost of the, uh, uh, their activity, or if they pay too little for the cost of that activity, then they'll do too much. And what you try to do is let them face the full cost of what they're doing. So um, you pay when you buy a good or other or a service, you pay for the labour that's involved, you pay for the raw materials that are involved, you pay for the capital that's involved in some shape or form. But unless there's action to change things, you don't pay for the impacts on others. So you're not bearing the costs of what you're doing in the way you normally would in a market. And it's those signals in the market that the main markets work well, so this is a market failure. So how do you correct a market failure? Well, the first answer of an economist, and it's not a bad answer, is to uh, think about prices so that people are faced with the costs of their action. And that's the story of incentives. So that's in the case of congestion charging. It's crude in London at the moment, but it's begun. Or in the case of pollution, people used to uh, uh, die uh, um, in the 50s and 60s much more than they do now from the air pollution from um, people burning coal. In, uh, as a heating in their houses. So what did we do? We said you can't burn smoky coal, you've got to burn smokeless coal. That was a regulation response to an externality, and we're quite used to these ideas, price mechanisms, regulation, and it's all sound stuff. But this is different. It's global. Uh, it doesn't matter where the stuff is emitted, it has the same uh, effect. Uh, global in its origins, global in its impact, long-term, uncertain, large and irreversible. The examples I gave were not like that. So our standard stuff of externalities, uh, which is the foundation of most of the economic approach to all this, and rightly so, is pretty different. And the economic analysis and the policy story has to take that difference into account. So it's obviously about risk, it's obviously about uh, ethics because of the uh, examples I've already given, and it's obviously about international action. How does all this thing work? Well, I've already said it works on many dimensions, um, mostly through water in some shape or form, and it gets worse as things get hotter. We're currently around 0.8 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial times. Think of that as 1850s or so. And uh, uh, we know that uh, because of the lag structure, what we've already done, that we're headed for probably another one, one and a half, even if we're, uh, uh, even if we're terribly sensible um, about all this. So we're headed for somewhere in the middle of this, and the name of the game is to make, uh, try to work out policies so that's roughly where it stops in terms of uh, warming. And so what we're doing through our policy is taking out um, not all, but some of the risk, indeed the bulk of the risk, of moving out into this right-hand side. So that's what policy is about. Trying to keep us... There's a, I hope this is a... Oh, there we are. The, the aim of policy is to try to keep us somewhere in this region... Uh, we're here already and seeing all sorts of effects. But what's the payoff to policy? It's clamping down on the probability of being up here. And that's the payoff to uh, our action. Um, what kind of um, 
probabilities associated with what? I've got a couple of slides on this. That stock is measured in parts per million of CO2 equivalent normally, and we're currently around 430. We used to be about 280 in uh, the middle of the 18, uh, in the middle of the 19th century. We're adding about two and a half a year uh, parts per million, and that two and a half, and this is just sort of crude roughly, but we're adding about two and a half a year, and that two and a half is going up pretty quickly. So if we did not very much for 30 years, probably over that 30 years we'd be averaging well above three. If we did nothing much for 100 years, we'd probably be averaging four-ish uh, per year over 100 years. So if we uh, did nothing much for 100 years, followed business as usual, that 430 parts per million would probably be over 800, and we'd be dropping off the bottom of, uh, of this graph. If we delayed for 30 years, that 430 parts per million might start to get close to 550. And if only then did we wake up to policy, it would be quite difficult to hold it back below 650s. So those are the kind of choices we're making and why delay matters so much um, in all this uh, story. The red bars are uh, confidence intervals, so there's a 5% probability of being off the bottom of one of those red bars given the concentration level, 5% probability of being off the top of one of those red bars. Those red bars there are crudely the um, probabilities that come out of the Hadley Centre model. Hadley Centre is the main UK climate change uh, modelling uh, centre, and we were very much consumers of the Hadley models. Basically, the Hadley models are, I think it's fair to say, sort of middle of the range. Um, they're not the most uh, strikingly uh, dispersed, and that's why we've got these dotted grey lines here. They rep they're just reminding us that there are other models which have much bigger spreads in terms of uh, possible outcomes than the Hadley models. So that's uh, a way of describing the kind of risks that are involved and what kind of policy choices are available to us. Let me just amplify that slightly, and I'll pick five degrees centigrade. You know, you can pick other parts of the distribution, but we'd be here all night if, if you tried to describe the whole distribution. Let me just take uh, five degrees centigrade. At 550, there's a 7% probability, um, this 7 uh, here. At 550, there's a... 7% probability of uh, going above 5 degrees centigrade. Um, at 650, there's a probability of around a quarter, that's a 24%, of going above 5 degrees centigrade. And at 750, there's a probability of close to a half of um, going above 5 degrees centigrade. Now, what we're playing for then is the... Uh, mine's just gone off here. Okay, so you can see it. Uh, I, I just have to look over my shoulder uh, uh, a little bit. Um, if you look at the, uh, just this column here, what we're playing for by keeping, what we're playing for by keeping stabilization levels down is a reduction in those probabilities. So that's one way of expressing what we're, uh, what we're doing here. Um, that actually allows me to give you, in a very quick, two slides, the whole structure of uh, this argument about stabilization. What essentially uh, is, uh, I've just given you, um, if we say something, and I will in just a moment, about why it's a bad thing to go to five degrees uh, centigrade or four degrees centigrade, but let's, I'll come back to that in just a minute, but assuming that you think that the prob a probability of a quarter is uh, really extremely worrying. Indeed, a property of 7% of going above 5 degrees centigrade is worrying enough. What you're saying is, provided we can get there at reasonable cost, and we'll have to work that out and study it, and we'll talk about that, provided we can get there at reasonable cost, it makes sense to try and stabilize around uh, 550 or below. Um, so that's a, taking us fairly quickly to a kind of target level that we might think about, provided we can make a good case about why it's so bad to go to these uh, higher temperatures. Now, if you get the stabilization, that tells you an enormous amount, stabilization target, that tells you an enormous amount about where the economics should go. Because um, what you'll then be able to do is to talk about what kind of flow paths over time, because remember that's a target stock, what kind of flow paths over time can take you there? 
If you then have a rough picture of that, you can say what kind of economic policies are going to generate the cuts of uh, 30% or 40% or 50% at different time periods that uh, correspond to that flow path. So from the stabilization story, which I think you can get to quite quickly, you very quickly get to uh, a flow story. From that flow story, you get to tar is essentially giving you your target cuts. Then you can look at the uh, cost of getting those target cuts, what kind of price incentives will get you to those target cuts, and you've got your economic policy. So that's the story, and that's the one which uh, um, essentially we went in the Stern Review. Now, remember, that's a bit different from the story I described at the beginning, because what the economists would do um, at first pass for a simplified form of problem is they'd say, well, what's the damage that you're doing when you do this? What's the damage you're doing when you commit your externality? And I'll make you pay for that. And notice that's not the route I've gone. The reason I haven't gone that route is that to calculate the marginal cost in terms of damage of an extra unit of carbon is logically, because of the scientific structure I've just described, an extremely difficult thing to do. I mean, just think of the logic. You're saying at time t, I'm going to emit or think about the cost of emitting a bit more carbon at that time. Well, what's the effect? If you kick up carbon at time t, then at all subsequent times, tor, you have a higher stock of carbon. The damage, of course, will depend on what path you're on because you're kicking it up relative to some path. So at time t, you kick up that carbon. At all subsequent times, the stocks will be higher. Because the stocks are higher, and you, so you have to work out that partial, partial derivative, and you've got a whole sequence of partial derivatives, those responses. So the stocks are higher, and so the temperatures are higher subsequently, depending on all the previous stock increases and the lag structures. So that's another lot of partial derivatives. And then you've got, well, if the temperatures are higher, the climate change is like this, quite a lot more partial derivatives. And if the climate change is like this, this will have the corresponding effect, uh, a corresponding effect, on people's activities in terms of extra damages. So you've got the expectation of the integral of a whole, of the sum of a whole multiple of chains of partial derivatives, onto which you've got to add some kind of ethical values to trace, as it were, future damages back to now. It is incredibly slippery. You want a social cost of carbon? I'll give you one. You know, change this assumption, change that assumption, fiddle around with it. It's inc incredibly sensitive. So the basic, simple economist approach, which is a sound and sensible one, what's the damage? I'll charge you that price, is just incredibly slippery to work out. On the other hand, the story I've told says that if you know roughly the path or you can give a good story about roughly the path you need to follow, you can work out what's the marginal cost of controlling to that path and that'll give you a take on the price in a way that I'll describe. So that's why we went a route, why it's different from a standard economic story, but it's very much in the spirit of the economics. It's just adapting it to this particular kind of problem. So that's, I've given you roughly that storyline. So I've given you a storyline which is about effectiveness. Are you acting on the scale that's necessary to uh, control these costs? And I've given you a story which begins to talk about efficiency. What are the kind of prices that are going to lead us to take the right kind of decisions? But I've got at it through the marginal cost. I haven't got at it through the uh, uh, social cost on the margin, which is the more traditional economics way of looking at it. But you can go back and check and say, Given that kind of marginal cost that you're talking about, associated with the cuts down to this kind of level, does it correspond roughly to the kind of social cost of carbon that you could find if you started to investigate along the more complicated lines that I've got? And you can do that and check, and roughly speaking, you know, the, the marginal cost of doing something turns out to be not so far away from the marginal reward from doing that thing, which is the averted social cost of carbon. So you can link back to the traditional economics argument, it's just you don't get at it through the route in which you would at first pass go from the traditional economics. So I've spoken about effectiveness, results on the right scale, I've spoken about efficiency, like what kind of prices are you going to need to get people to uh, bring down 
the social cost of carbon, uh, bring down the emissions as uh, cheaply as possible. The other part in terms of the kind of criteria you need to bring to bear is equity. Um, who's carrying what burdens? And I want to speak a bit more about that. So I've spoken about risks and targets and described the route that we actually went. Now what I want to do is to go very fast through the modeling part of the story because it is quite dense technically. I haven't got the time to go uh, through it and there's uh, bucketfuls of it in print for those of you who like that sort of thing. But essentially I'll give you the, uh, I'll just go straight to results and try to explain them as simply as I can. Along the top, you've got an attitude to risk, which is captured by this gamma function, no, gamma parameter. The gamma parameter tells you how fast the welfare weights on somebody with this kind of consumption would fall. The idea is that if people are better off, then a little bit extra to them is worth less socially than something extra to people who are less well off. Um, and how fast does that weight, if you like, fall? How fast does that weight on the increments fall? That's the gamma parameter. So one says it falls like the reciprocal, two says it falls like the square of uh, consumption. Um, it's also um, a story in economics about risk aversion. Um, you can show that these kinds of parameters, if people maximize the expectation of their utility as opposed to their utility in, in, a, random, in a stochastic context, then you can show that that's the in, an index of risk aversion as well. The higher you go out that side, the less people fancy risk, or the more they're averse to risk. Now, down the left-hand side, I've got a gamma parameter, and that is, in these kind of models, the power that relates uh, temperature changes to damage. So damage goes up like the gamma power of the increment in temperature. So it's saying that for a higher gamma, the faster uh, damages go up in your model is in response to increments in temperature. You can also think of that, although you can do this much more directly, and we did, but in terms of just a simple explanation, you can think of it either as uh, damages going up faster than temperature if you have a higher gamma, sorry, ga damages going up faster if you have a, uh, with temperature if you have a higher gamma, but you can also think of it as uh, temperature going up faster for given emissions. So you can think of it also like stochastic weights in the tail if you want to, just the point, point of view of this very simple exposition. So you can think the higher the gamma essentially the greater the probability of nasty things happening. Um, I'm just using it as a summary thing because you can talk about the bigger spread of the distribution in a very direct way as well, looking th directly at bigger spreads in the distribution. And the numbers, uh, I won't go into the brackets here, but the numbers here are the percentage losses averaged over space, averaged over time, and averaged over outcomes. So averaged in those three ways, um, we're saying that uh, a business as usual, if you go up into the top left-hand corner here, that business as usual gives you around a 10% loss in GDP, averaged over space, time, and uh, outcome. And you obviously have to build models to get to uh, that outcome, and you have to define the averaging, and the averaging is very important, and it depends on uh, discounting, which is a uh, contentious subject in economics and so on. That's the averaging over time if you like. So um, this is the kind of result that we got. Now, this one we used um, uh, as a center of our base case, because we did quite a lot of sensitivity analysis, but for our base case, we took um, E to equals one, which is like uh, the uh, welfare weight going down like one over consumption, like the reciprocal of consumption. And we took gamma equals about two. Now, my own view, given what we now see of the evidence is that we badly underestimated the risks. We badly underestimated the risks in the sense that emissions are going up faster than most people thought. If you look at the new uh, International uh, Energy Agency report which came out uh, a month or two ago with studies of India and China, 
they'll show that China's emissions are going to double um, by 2030 from around five or six tons uh, uh, per capita now to um, 10 or 12 tons per capita in 2030 if you take all the emissions together. Now, I've lived and worked in China, and you don't have to do that to recognize that China doesn't do doubling in 25 years. China does doubling in 10, um, if you're just talking about growth. Now, maybe emissions won't go up as fast as growth. Maybe they won't. But um, doubling in uh, 25 years, and which was the IEA's uh, prediction, I think is incredibly conservative. And I know they came under very intense uh, political pressure to keep the forecasts down. Um, I think we underestimated, and that's not, and I'm giving that as one example, I'm not talking just about China, or even blaming China for becoming the world's center of production. I mean, it's after all, we consume what they produce. It's um, um, just what I want to draw attention to is I think we underestimated the emissions. I think we underestimated uh, how the absorption. Um, the scientists will tell us, there are many of them here, that uh, there's some grave risks over the world's, the planet's ability to absorb the carbon that's emitted, for example, through the decrease of the absorptive capacity of the oceans or positive feedback like the release of uh, methane from thawing permafrost. That, those features, or indeed the collapse of the Amazon forest, which might take place at three or four degrees centigrade, all those are known risks, but they haven't played strong parts in... Uh, the probabilistic modeling that I'm just describing. The climate sensitivity, the response of uh, uh, temperature to stocks is something where, as I've said, we were quite cautious and there are lots of quite credible um, distributions of climate sensitivity, responsiveness of temperature to stocks, which go out much further than uh, we did. So um, for all these reasons, and I think the damage functions that we used were far too conservative. I think we underestimated the risks. I would take that, uh, I would take a strong move down the uh, rows here uh, relative to what we did, given what we knew then actually, but also given what we've learned. So um, at the same time, I would probably share with some of my economist friends a raising of this uh, uh, eta uh, parameter somewhere in that direction. I don't know how far and it's the kind of, that's very much a part of the ethics story. And what I'll argue, but only briefly, is that we have to have that ethical argument and discussion in a very direct way. There's no market information that's going to tell us what the answer to that question is about what this coefficient of relative risk aversion or what this egalitarian parameter um, should look like. That doesn't mean there's nothing to say or there's no rational argument to have, but we have to have it explicitly about the ethics. We can't just read off something from the market which will carry it all for us. So um, I've told you not to take the model seriously. I won't go into all the details about why you shouldn't take models seriously, but economists aren't terribly good at forecasting what's going to happen next year. Forecasting what's going to happen over 100, 200, and 300 years is uh, even more difficult. Um, those of you who uh, read 1066 and all that will know that uh, Robin Hood found, more difficult shooting, found it more difficult to shoot the sheriff when he was running than when the sheriff was standing still, um, trying to do this economic modeling with all this kind of uncertainty and over very long periods is much more difficult than uh, the kind of economic modeling we normally do. So you should always have some suspension of disbelief anyway, but in this case I think it's much more uh, difficult than all that. That doesn't mean you can't do the modeling or you shouldn't do the modeling. You can do some modeling and you can do some, and you should do some modeling, but be careful not to take it uh, too seriously and think of more than one way. And for me, the modeling was the supplementary, um, the supplementary argument. So um, I'm just comparing, and I'm not going to go into detail here. What this is saying is that the models, why do we get answers different from other economists? Well, there are three reasons, essentially. One, we approach the ethics somewhat differently, but of course we did sensitivity analysis to that, and I've already discussed some of that. Secondly, is we used uncertainty, risk and uncertainty, where most of the previous models didn't do that. They used point estimates, and this is just the kind of range that we used. We used the page model uh, developed by uh, Chris Hope at, uh, at um, Cambridge University. So that's us. This is the IPCC range. This is the full range of the, of the page model. 
This is uh, part of the IPCC range, and this is the Mindshausen range from uh, the book edited by John Schellenhuber, uh, Avoiding Dangerous Climate Change, in, uh, published in 2006, which takes a much broader range of models and, of course, gets a bigger range of possible outcomes. So one reason we got different results is that we tried to take uncertainty seriously, and I think the previous modeling stuff didn't. Now, this some of you may find a bit troubling, but essentially it's the um, losses of world GDP in relation to temperature increases. And quite ludicrously, in my view, some of the earlier literature had for temperature increases for five or six degrees centigrade, which is absolutely planet transforming, and I'll just spend a word, of, a word or two about that just now, of, of two or three percent of GDP. Now, um, I'm not the scientist, obviously, but if you think about five degrees centigrade, to find historical comparisons, you have to go back uh, 50 million years. Um, to get two or three degrees centigrade more than now, you have to go back two or three million years. It's quite hard to think about what the consequences for human life would be when the only evidence we've got is from that far back. But let me give you a for example. We do have evidence um, from much more recently what it was like to be 5 degrees C less than we are now, and that's the last ice age of 10, 12,000 years ago. Um, the ice sheets came down to somewhere south of New York, just north of uh, London and corresponding latitudes. So people who were sensible um, didn't live there. They lived further south. So what does that tell us? It says that these kinds of changes actually transform the physical geography of the world, where people can live and how they can live their life. They are not marginal changes. They're colossal changes which force very big changes of location. And it's reasonable to suppose that five degrees centigrade more would indeed force very big changes in location. The ice sheets would melt. It would be a world largely without ice, you'd be, see very high sea level rises and, um, well, if your place becomes inundated, then uh, you move, well, ideally before it becomes inundated. So what you're seeing is changes of a magnitude. You'd, you know, the, the whole of the water structure of um, the Himalayas would change. That feeds the countries where three billion people, half the world's population, lives. Th those things would be... Um, Sell, Eitan, I would sell. Um, the, uh, you're talking about transformations of where people can live. We know from recent history, indeed not so recent history, that where people, um, uh, if people move, you get very big conflict. We see that in a small but important scale in Darfur. So what you've got is uh, a transformation of the planet, a movement of where people can live, and probably whole-scale conflict. The kind of losses that you have to imagine from this kind of change have to be very big. It's very difficult, and you can see why it's so difficult to model, to be specific. But these kind of numbers seem to me to be much too small. And I think the kind of numbers we used are probably, uh, which are around here, I think they're probably much too small as well. Can I tell you what they should be? Not really, because it's so difficult to describe that kind of world. But some of the discussion I've had with colleagues today is how, about how you would go about uh, describing that in a bit more detail so that we come still more convincing about why it's important to keep those increases down below 5 degrees centigrade. Now, I'm really not going to go through this lot. This tells you that if you discount hard enough, then um, anything that happens in the future can be ignored. And there's always be a way of discounting which will suppress your worry about any possible effect. At the same time, for any given discounting, there'll always be a description of how horrible the future is that would overwhelm the discounting. So there's just a simple mathematical statement of those two things, and it's telling us that we have to worry about the ethics involved in discounting, and we have to worry um, about just how big the damage is or the risk. So it's a simple mathematical way of underlining that basic point yet again. Um, I've, already started, I've already talked about ETA, the elasticity that, uh, uh, that it represents, and I'm not going to go into any detail. I'm more than happy to uh, answer questions on that. But what a point I'm making here is that if you try to read that off from market 
uh, evidence on savings, on attitudes to risk, on attitudes to redistribution, it's actually going to be very difficult. And there's no sidestepping, in my view, the direct discussion uh, through thought experiments, the standard tool of moral philosophy, really, of what you should be doing here. Um, I've already spoken about discounting, and I'm more than happy to pick that up in questions. But again, I do not think that there's a market out there that can tell you what um, the people are, who are alive now in thinking about what an appropriate collective action is um, relative to the state of affairs now and states of affairs in 100, 150, 200 years. There's no market that tells you what the trade-off that people actually do have about sacrifices now versus um, uh, rewards in a, to people living 150 years from now from a collective action decision. There's nothing in the market story that will tell you about that in any direct sense. It's not that there's no information, but it is very indirect information, and filtering it essentially gets you directly into the kind of ethical discussion that I've argued is unavoidable. So that's the, uh, that's the discounting story. And if you want to go through the market route, all I'm saying here is you can find numbers to support whatever case you want. It's not that this is arbitrary. It's that simply uh, we have to think through uh, in a very uh, careful way the ethics. So um, I've said then uh, where I think the Stern Review uh, underestimated. I've said uh, we underestimated the risks. I would seriously consider higher values uh, of risk aversion or a higher, stronger uh, uh, aversion to inequality, and uh, we'd end up roughly with numbers. Now, um, I'm going to be very fast on the uh, um, emissions paths and the costs because I want to spend much of the time that remains on policy and a global deal. Essentially, these are the flow paths which correspond to different stabilization paths. The yellow one is stabilization at 550. It's the flows that get you there and we'd have to cut by 30%, roughly speaking, relative to uh, 2,000. Um, the red or orangey path is uh, uh, 500 parts per million stabilization, corresponding to cuts around 50% by uh, 2050. So those are the kind of flow paths, and the blue path is business as usual. This is selling, telling us that emissions come from everywhere, so um, we're going to have to act across the board. You cannot look simply at transport and uh, power generation. They are important, but they're only 40% of the story. You've got to act across the board. Now, what about the costs? If you act as sensibly as you can, there are two ways of looking at the costs. You can look at strategy by strategy or, or segment by segment, I should say. What can you do from energy efficiency? What you can do from different kinds of energy efficiency? What can you do from stopping uh, deforestation? If you go back here, this land use story tells us that uh, something up to 20% of our emissions uh, come from uh, deforestation or, or forest degradation. So um, what, that's a source of, uh, that's a way of cutting back by cutting back on deforestation. So you can think about all the different ways of doing things and uh, think about what are the cheapest, think about what most expensive, and for any target cuts in emissions, you can work out how the total cost of getting there would look. So this is a, uh, a diagram from uh, McKinsey's, and on the bottom here, over to the left, you've got um, the energy efficiency stories largely, which says that there are lots of ways of reducing um, emissions which have negative costs because you're saving on energy. As you go out, you get more ambitious about the kind of cuts you want to make. That moves out to the right, and there are various options like nuclear and uh, stopping deforestation and carbon capture and storage. I'm not saying that McKinsey's have got these numbers right. I think they're important numbers there. They've got wrong. The point is that you can construct options like that and uh, go out along that curve. And if you say, well, this is the kind of cut we should be looking for up here, you've got the marginal cost of getting there. So this is just giving a bit of meat on the bones of what I said earlier. Think about the kind of cuts that you've got to do, and that will give you strong information about the marginal costs of actually getting there, what it would cost you for the last bit. And that will give you your take on the price, because if you set that kind of price, then everybody, all the routes, all the routes that have got a cost less than that price, uh, 
will actually um, be chosen and uh, the marginal cost will be equal to the price. That's uh, just um, economics 101. But knowing where you want to go, roughly speaking, tells you a great deal about the price, much more reliably than the other routes which economists would have us go. So that's the cost story. When you do it that way, you get to costs of getting down below 550 of around 1% of uh, GDP. The evidence that's come in after we published has suggested that on the whole 1% might be on the high side. Um, the McKinsey story comes in at less than ours. The International Energy Agency that published after us came up with numbers which were a bit smaller than ours. But only if you do it well. Notice if you go back here and you follow policies that force you right out this end by some government specification that you've got to do this, that, and the other, you can make those costs much bigger. So policy matters. You, you, what you want to do is to pick the cheap options and then go up and... Uh, and if you're stopping here, you want to be choosing all those options. But if government policy through some regulation or moving people off in the wrong direction takes you out here and you're ignoring some of the ones down here, then, of course, it's going to cost you a lot more. So policy matters a great deal, and price mechanisms are a good way of picking out the least cost options. So that's the story, that you can get these uh, probabilities down, that you can stabilize at 505, 50 parts per million at a cost of around 1%. The damages I came up with, which you would avoid, would be 8, 9, 10% or more. So it's a very good deal to do that. And even if you fiddle around with some of the equity and discounting parameters I described, you still get the result that the averted damages, the cost of inaction, is a lot more than the cost of action, which is around these 1% stories. Notice also that this is a growth story. It's low carbon growth. It is not a low growth story. If we allow the argument to dissolve into um, you know, growth versus climate responsibility, climate responsibility will lose. So A, it's politically not savvy, but B, more importantly, it's not right because there are lots of options for growth which will actually build up, lots of op options for low-carbon growth which will allow us to continue growing. So uh, it's a low-carbon growth story, not a low-growth story. Now, let me say something about policy. I've actually said something about policy um, um, along the way. So I'm saying prices matter, and you can get to prices through taxes. You can get to prices through trading, through quantity allocations, and then people trade on those quantities. So what I would want to argue here is that we should look at different parts of the economy. Sometimes we'll use taxes. Sometimes we'll use trading. And it will depend where we're looking. European Union Emissions Trading Scheme covers um, just about 50% of the emissions in Europe by focusing on uh, quite few industries. We have a very heavy taxes on gasoline in most of Europe. I wouldn't argue that we should change that. Uh, that works okay. Taxation works in that part of the economy. You don't want these things to overlap because otherwise the price signals get very confused. But you want both quotas and taxes. They're both sensible instruments, and you'll want some form of regulation. How you design the trading schemes matters a lot. But the reason for wanting a big chunk of trading in the story is a threefold. First, it gives you quantity certainty in a way that price mechanisms don't. If you just set a, a price, the quantity turns out to be what it will be, and uh, there'll be some randomness there. There's a danger of overshooting. Quantity mechanisms, which are then decentralized through trading, um, give you much more quantity certainty, though, at the cost of some price volatility. Secondly, trading will allow you to bring in developing countries in a strong way. And uh, because what you can do is set strong targets in rich countries and then, through trading, um, allow some of that to be bought down in poor countries, which means there's a private sector financial flow to the poor countries, which gives them an incentive to come in, and that would be absolutely crucial to their coming in. So let me not, and combating deforestation is a very big part of the story. I'll s skip over um, more detail on the policy side. I've given you the guts of the policy story in these five points. Price, bring forward technology, overcome all the kind of information barriers which prevent people from uh, exploiting the kind of energy efficiency options that they might want to exploit. Um, you also can have a discussion about what responsible behavior is. 
most of us drive carefully, not simply because of the penalties for not driving carefully, but because we think it's irresponsible not to drive carefully. So people's understanding of a problem will also affect what they do. And finally, as I've mentioned already, combating deforestation. Design of trading mechanism matters a great deal, and there's a lot to be said about that. I'm not going to go into any detail on that. Um, I believe strongly that we should be moving to auctioning over time. If you don't auction, you're giving away public revenue, you're slowing the uh, adjustment process, and you're giving um, special non-competitive uh, non um, advantages to incumbents who get the quotas. So moving to auctioning of quotas as uh, Barack Obama said in the debates yesterday, seems to me to be a wholly good idea. This tells you that there's very heavy learning in technologies. Along the vertical axis, there's the cost of electricity. On the horizontal axis, there's experience with production using these particular kinds of technologies. It goes down. That tells us that uh, experience is important, and it's differentially important in different technologies, depending on how mature they are. So some kind of feed-in tariffs giving a bit of a bonus to those technologies where you think learning is going to take place particularly rapidly does make some kind of economic sense. This is the story of what's happened to public sector energy R&D over the last 20 or 25 years. It's dropped like a brick. It's essentially halved over the last 20, 25 years. So a big part of the recommendation is turning that story around. It's actually even worse than that because there are big numbers on nuclear in there. Now, what about the global deal? Let me spend the last few minutes that remain on what I think a global deal should look like. Well, first, what are people talking about? They're talking about cuts in the right kind of range. In the diagram I showed on flows, I argued that 500 or 550 should be giving us, as a stabilization target, should be giving us cuts in flows by 2050 of around 50% or so. Heiligen Dam uh, G8, G5 summit in uh, June of this year, chaired by uh, Germany, uh, gave that kind of target. Because it's a G8 communique, it was a bit vague on what was being compared with what. It should be comparing with 1990, really, but they skated over that. But never mind, that's a G8 communique. Um, and it wasn't clear how strongly the different parties agreed with the communique. But at least it had a target in the right ballpark and has set, as it were, I think, a sensible benchmark, which is directly in the... It is close to the ballpark of the 500 or so parts per million stabilisation target. Now, what have the rich countries um, been going for? As you know, California's got an 80% reduction target by 2050. At Bali, uh, New Zealand, Norway and Costa Rica announced a 100% reduction target by 2050. Norway particularly knowing that it would have to buy in some of that reduction through trading mechanisms, but still a 100% target. Since 2004, France have had their factor 4, which is a, a reduction by a factor of 4, 75% reduction by 2050. Um, it, as I heard the debate amongst the four Democratic candidates last night, um, the, uh, not just Hillary Clinton's talking about 80%, but most of the other three. Notice that uh, that statement is in brackets and there's an E dot G dot in front of uh, Hillary Clinton, but it's just a, an example of showing that the, where the kinds of debates about rich country targets are going. 50% um, overall, 80% or so for rich countries. And uh, Germany's got a 40% reduction by 2020. Now, just how strong and egalitarian does an 80% reduction target for rich countries look in the context of 50% overall. You're saying, ah, oh, 50% overall, 80% for rich countries. You know, jolly good. They're being very nice and sensible and generous and all that. Now, I want to argue that they're not particularly. Um, it's 80% reduction in the context of 50% overall reduction is a whole lot better than 60% reduction for rich countries in the, cost of, uh, in the context of 50% overall. But it's not that generous. And let's just look at it in turn, not the percentages, the absolutes. We're emitting, 400, we're emitting 40 to 45 gigatons a year as a world with 6 billion people, 7 tons on average per capita. If we do cut by a half, as we should, as I've argued, if we do cut by a half, then we'll be around 2025 in 2050 gigatons CO2 equivalent per annum. Population of 9 billion, 
Well, you don't have to have a prince in education to divide, you know, divide 40 or 45 by 6 billion, 20, 25 by 9 billion. It's telling us, on average, you've got to go down from 7 tons per capita down to 2 or 3. Where are we now? US over 20, Europe a bit over 10, China a bit over 5, India around 2. The currently poor countries of the world will be 8 billion out of the 9 billion. We hope not so poor, but the currently poor countries will be 8 billion out of the 9 billion. Even if the rich countries drop to zero, the um, poor countries average would have to be about two or three tons per capita. That's a measure of the challenge. Now, I've argued in quantitative terms that the costs of getting there are not that bad if we go after it in sensible ways with good policies. And there's a lot of evidence for that. But the size of the change we have to recognize. It does involve radical change in the way we do energy. So if the US cut by 80%, divide by five, that would take its 20-some down to four-ish, still above the average in 2050, if we all get to where we want to go. Europe would just have got to the average. Japan, quite similar to Europe, would have just got to the average. So 80% cuts in a 50% global context, 80% cuts for the rich countries, would leave, on average, the rich countries above the average in 2050. Even if they all got to the average in 2050, um, what would that be saying? Essentially, if you think of there being a reservoir which we're filling up, or which, a reservoir which we're drawing down on, corresponding to the atmosphere getting full, we were at 280 in 1850. 200 years later, we're saying we've got to get close to stabilization at 500 or 550. Call it 550 for the sake of the argument. So the, the reservoir is size 270, going from 280 to 550. And what we're saying is at the end of this two-century period of drawing down this reservoir, or correspondingly filling up the atmosphere, at the end of it, after 200 years, we're all going to be drinking out of glasses of the same size. No matter what guzzling went on in the 200 years preceding. So in other words, if you think of this in terms of stocks rather than flows, to equalize the flows towards the end of that period doesn't look spectacularly egalitarian to me. So that's a measure, if you like, of just pointing out to us that 80% sounds like the minimum that we should be asking rich countries to do in the context of 50% cuts overall. It just gets the flows equal at the end of the period. And a Brazilian friend said to me, he said, it's just like the poor cousin coming to a big dinner um, just for the coffee and being asked to split the bill equally amongst all the people who, uh, who were there. Um, so, yes, let's go for 80%. And it is the, the right thing to do relative to 70% or 60%. But let's not over-congratulate ourselves by, about how egalitarian we're being about all this. This is just an illustration of, roughly speaking, uh, this is just the um, uh, only CO2 emissions, not all greenhouse gases. You know, but you've got US, China, Canada, Australia up the top there. You've got um, in China, Brazil, India down the bottom. And you've got um, Europe, roughly speaking, in the middle. China ticking up very quickly. Uh, all back of the envelope calculations suggest that China will emit in the next 25 years uh, roughly what um, Europe and United States have emitted over the last 100. Now, that doesn't mean we're all lost. It's not. It's just saying we're in a bit of a hurry here and uh, China's got to be part of the story along with everybody else. And the key bit missing in the story at the moment, of course, is United States. If United States comes into this strongly, a tremendous amount would follow. So um, I've told the story of the uh, reservoir. Let me spend the last two or three minutes on the global deal. But I've actually described it already, so this is more or less a summary. 50% um, cuts corresponding to stabilization by 2050, corresponding to stabilization around 500 parts per million or 550, corresponding to keeping the probabilities of these very nasty events of 4, 5, and 6 degrees centigrade in tolerable uh, levels. It isn't safe, but it's a whole lot safer than uh, you, 650 with its 25% or quarter probability of being above 5 degrees centigrade. I've gone over why 75, 80% targets for rich countries is the minimum we should be asking, and it's the minimum the poor countries are asking. They're very, very mad about this whole story. 
and rightly so. It's the rich countries that are responsible for filling up this atmosphere, running down this well. It's the poor countries that are hit earliest and hardest. And unless any global deal recognize, recognizes that inequity, it won't stick as a global deal. Um, I've emphasized the importance of trade as providing the kind of financial flow that gives poor countries an incentive to come in to this deal. Sharing of technology I'll mention in just a moment. So this is the targets market side of the story. The last bullet point at the bottom here is a technical one about how you need to reform the trading mechanism to make it capable of carrying the load which I think it will have to carry. I won't go into that in any detail, but it's a radical reform of the clean development mechanism for those of you who know about that part of the story. Funding issues, there's only six parts of the global deal. You've seen three. The first three are about targets and trade, and this is about funding issues. First, um, public funding for deforestation. Those of us who've looked at this reckon, and I've discussed this at length with Jeff Heal and others from uh, Columbia, um, for 10 or $15 billion per annum, I reckon we could cut deforestation by half. That would be giving us carbon reductions at about $5 a tonne of CO2. Now, you have to go into the evidence quite carefully. For this to be true, you'd have to do some experiments to make sure that you're using the right kind of methods, and you'd have to have um, those experiments run by the countries in which the trees stand. It would be quite wrong for those outside to go around telling people how to do their deforestation, but it's the obligation of those outside to support those who are trying to take on uh, deforestation. And uh, I th there are many of us who think it could be done, at least half of it could be done, not all of it could be done at around $5 a tonne. McKinsey's don't agree with that, but I think they got it wrong, but that's another, another uh, discussion. Um, demonstrating and sharing of technology is absolutely fundamental, and amongst those technologies, well, let them all compete with each other but carbon capture and storage for coal will be absolutely crucial. India and China will use coal. Probably so will Poland. Probably so will Germany, um, even though German, Germany is moving fairly fast to renewables. Over the next 20, 25 years, 30, probably 35 years, a lot of coal will be used. We've got to get good and get good quickly at carbon capture and storage for coal because we can't stop it. Why are India and China using coal? There's a very good reason that it's there. It's cheap, uh, they understand the technologies, and they can get on with it quickly. And uh, that's going to drive uh, their policy. So we have to help get good at carbon capture and storage for coal. Otherwise, this whole problem is not going to be um, impossible, but it's going to get much more difficult if we fail uh, to do that. Um, so demonstrating and sharing of technologies, and we ought to be, as economists and public policy people, concentrating very hard on just how we share the technologies. Do we have buyouts of patents? Do we uh, give incentives for joint ventures so that the know-how can be shared? How is that going to be done? There's lots of difficult economics of public policy in how to make that happen. We don't know nothing, but we need to uh, operate much more quickly. Now, finally, I've said almost nothing about adaptation, and that's another story. It's a big other story, and uh, yeah, I can't do justice in it in really the same lecture as mitigation, but um, which is what I've been, obviously what I've been talking about. But the climate is going to change on us, even if we're much more sensible than we have been in the past, and it's going to be particularly difficult for developing countries. I draw your attention to the Human Development Report, which was published by UNDP um, a, uh, about a month ago, and uh, they argued that in 2015, remember 2015 is talking about a 0.8 or 1 degree centigrade increase, that the extra costs facing developing countries because of climate change might cost them another $85 billion a year. My own view is that's quite conservative. That's roughly the same order of magnitude as total overseas development assistance. If we doubled overseas development assistance by 2015 as a world, um, you can see that, uh, that, would, that the costs of climate change might eat, eat up roughly half of the new level of development assistance. These are big numbers. And the, uh, these are costs largely, we're talking about the near future now, largely imposed on poor countries by rich countries. That is a responsibility, it seems to me, that uh, we have to look at directly. And again, if you're talking about the equity characteristics of a global deal that would bring developing countries into the story, I think uh, at least delivery on the promises on overseas development assistance uh, 
is, uh, is absolutely necessary. And we can't wring this out of the uh, environment minister's discussion. It has to be a separate discussion in terms of different ministries integrated into that environmental discussion. So that's the global deal. It doesn't seem to me so complicated. It seems to me fairly driven by the science and then the uh, economics of the problem. There's reason to believe the rich countries uh, are going there. And there's starting to be reason to believe that with the right kind of incentives on the financial flow side, the right kind of sharing of technologies, that the poor countries will come in. Why? Because it's in their interests to do so. India and China know that this matters very much to them. They're very vulnerable. And they know that they're potential deal breakers. So they're concentrating. They're taking it very seriously. But you still get the first sentence of the discussion. You guys stuck it up there through your dirty growth policies, now you found out there was a mistake and you're telling us now that we've got to be a big part of the solution. We know we've got to be a big part of the solution, but let's think about the equity in all this and design the global deal with that very much in mind. And I think we can all see where they're coming from. So the ethics of the global deal take us in that direction, but they're felt so strongly by developing countries that those ethical views by them are a very big political reality that we have to take into account. So what does this global, this is my last slide, what is the nature of this deal? It is not like the WTO where nobody does anything until everybody's agreed on everything. Because that's a recipe for things happening at a very low pace and we're in a hurry for the reasons I described. But what's very encouraging about this is that people's attitude is very different from trade. Non-economists find trade very difficult, the arguments for trade very difficult to understand. When Paul Samuelson was awarded the Nobel Prize, the second Nobel Prize in economics, um, uh, about, about 30 years ago, his physicist colleagues who'd got Nobel Prizes in MIT teased him and said, Paul, give us one important economic result that's non-trivial. And um, Paul said comparative advantage, and he was right. And people don't find it very uh, easy to understand the gains from trade. And they oppose it, and you get constant appeals for protectionism. Listen to the democratic debate last night. Very powerful doses of protectionism in it from people who were very lucid on climate change. The encouraging thing about this is that people understand it much more readily than they do many other aspects of policy. And they're demanding action. The Australian people, bless them, threw out John Howard in the elections in November. There are many reasons to throw out prime ministers, um, particularly in this case. But one of, them, one, of them was, one of them was his attitude on climate change. And uh, Kevin Rudd was elected, and he immediately signed Kyoto, and he went to Bali, uh, one of the few prime ministers that was actually there. It was a radical change as a result of an election. Nicolas Hulot, the great French TV uh, ecologist, in the French elections uh, for presidency, said to, uh, he, he gave a date in the middle of February, of the end of February, and he said to all the presidential candidates, unless you show up at a place and time of my specification and sign up to my ecological pact, which was in large measure about climate change, I'm running for president. They all came. They all signed, and they competed with each other over the sincerity of their signatures. It's quite remarkable how the politics in rich countries are changing. I'll leave you to judge how the politics in the United States is changing. But the discussion in 2007 and early 2008 on climate change and policy to, on climate change in the U.S. is very different, at least to an outsider, than it looked like in 2005 and 2006. Quite remarkable change. And you're seeing, I think, tremendous pressure for action in rich countries from the bottom. In my own country, the three main political parties are competing with each other on this issue as who's the soundest and the strongest and the most reliable and the most creative. And it is quite remarkable. So I think the enforcement mechanism of all this is what people demand in rich countries. I don't actually think that's going to be the enforcement mechanism in too many developing countries. I think there the incentive structure will be absolutely crucial. You've got to get the financial flows going. The only way to do it is trading. You've got to get the technology shared. And unless there's policy 
to push it being shared, it will not be shared. What the Indians are terrified of is being forced into a deal where they have to uh, follow uh, different kinds of technologies and then some bunch of um, uh, Westerners comes and rips them off for the technologies. They're extremely sensitive to that and you can see why. And trust me, it doesn't go down very well. In indeed, a certainly from a pre-colonial power like uh, UK, saying trust me to India doesn't go down very well. <laughs> We've got to show that these financial flows work. And that's why I was talking about and describing the Globe and Deal, key elements in how to build it through these uh, trading mechanisms. Give confidence that these flows will work. Show over time, the next five or ten years, we're in a hurry, that technologies will be demonstrated and shared. And then start to talk about targets for developing countries. Once you've seen how these things actually work. So I think we can build the global deal. It'll be built in rich countries in the way I described and what people demand and what people demand will depend on how they understand it. And that's why the work that the scientists have done is so successful, I think, and remarkably so. But it, we need much more. And uh, why I think the economists haven't really stepped up to the plate yet on this uh, challenge. But, Lots of them are moving in a good direction, so I think that's going to change too. So that's the way in which this global deal will be constructed in a way which will be sustained. Through discussion in the ballot box in rich countries and through the right kind of incentive structures relative to poor countries. So basically, we know where we should be going, stabilisation at 500 or so. We know the paths to take us there. We know the policies to follow. And it seems to me that we uh, should just get on with it. Thank you very much. We have about 10 minutes where we can take some questions. You want to field your own questions? Or I... Yeah. Okay, good. We have a microphone, wait. Um, I wonder if you could talk about why does it matter and why the, the, the measurement of emissions is at the level of production rather than consumption? Just to take a silly example, I mean, if a factory is moved from the United States to China and then the goods are shipped from China back into the United States, it doesn't seem like anything is accomplished. And, and maybe this is all captured by what you've said, but I've, I've kind of lost the thread on that. Yeah. Um, first, we should recognize that um, movement of industrial activity because of environmental policies uh, in the past has been very small. The location of economic activity is governed by all sorts of things, relative wage rates, competence, investment, climate, and so on. And certainly in the empirical, the empirical lesson is in the past, those things dominate environmental regulation or that kind of story. Um, but the fact that the international division of labor has been changing so radically over the last 20 years or so just underlines how important it is to um, get a global deal and to think about the best way of bringing in countries like China and India into the story. So what I'm saying is that even if we follow responsible policies in rich countries, I don't think it will result in very much extra movement of output. And we tried in the review to investigate that uh, propensity to move in a little bit of uh, detail. But it does mean that uh, uh, those countries to which output is in any case moving, we have to bring into the deal in some way or other. There's a second question is that should your responsibilities for action be based on your consumption or your production? And uh, my own quick answer to that question would be consumption. Um, but it's quite difficult to um, organize um, this other than on a country policy basis. But if you go back to the kind of thing that I was saying, the big consuming countries are the rich countries. Um, probably the rich countries have 80% or so. The 1 billion people out of the 6 billion probably have 80% or so of the uh, consumption. Depends a bit what kind of exchange rates you need use for the comparisons, but, but they have the bulk 
of the consumption. So the kind of story I'm telling in the Global Deal, although not in a very precise way, I think does actually capture the kind of story that uh, you're worrying about and rightly worrying about, in, uh, in my view. So designing, I think, overall country policies um, in terms of target reductions and then going through with trading mechanisms on that basis, my feeling is would pick up most of the kind of anxieties that you're looking at, provided, of course, you bring in everybody into the story. Over there. If I, read, if I read your chart right, your goal would be to get China down to two from current five. Is there a sign that the Chinese are willing to negotiate in that direction per capita? Um, it, so the reason I'm hesitating is it's not only through negotiation. Yeah? It, it's where do they want to go and how can we persuade them to do more. Um, one of the things we need in, in putting a global deal together is to respect what other people are doing. Um, you can't sell an American car in China. It doesn't satisfy the emissions requirements. At the end of last year, they introduced a tax on uh, energy uh, um, intensive exports. Over the 11th five-year plan, which started just over a year ago, they've got a 20% target for reduction of um, energy to output. The, U the European counterpart is, is doing that over 15 uh, years. They're reforesting in China. They're not uh, deforesting. Um, the Chinese 11th five-year plan talked about a number of harmonies. Um, we would talk about trade-offs often in the kind of language we use, but it's kind of a positive way of talking about. Um, and the, one of the key, that, you know, some of it was urban versus rural, western versus eastern China, but central to it was harmony of growth and uh, environment. They are starting to take this uh, very seriously, and it's a recognition of their vulnerability. And when Zhu Rongji started to see what damage internally uh, pollution was causing in China in the mid-90s. They changed very radically and you saw much more um, uh, soil conservation in, uh, in the Loess Plateau in central China and so on. So they're moving very strongly and fast to an understanding of the issue. But there is a big problem. I mean, they still are opening two big coal-fired power stations a week. So, um, but at the same time, when I'm talking in China and they tell me that why should we do anything because the United States is 20, 25 tons per capita, they didn't sign uh, Kyoto, uh, they're not interested, um, they're so enormous, um, you know, we're just going to get on with our lot and when they wake up to the reality, then start to talk to us. And you have to tell uh, a counterparty, a, co a corresponding story uh, about what is the U.S. doing. Well, the U.S. is doing rather a lot on the technological front, and you emphasise that California has long had quite strong uh, ambitions in this area. So the first thing, I think, in creating this kind of understanding, and I'm not talking, I'm not using in yet the language of negotiation, in changing that kind of understanding, there's start with some appreciation of what the different parties are doing. And then you have to look at the particular problem and, you know, and the particular problems, and clearly two of them are enormous. One is the growth of uh, car and air transport, and the other, even bigger, is the uh, growth of coal-fired electricity in a very rapidly growing economy. And my own view there is that the combination of the two things I described is uh, stronger carbon trading and demonstrating quickly that carbon capture and storage for coal is uh, viable. It's, the kind of prices that we'd be talking about, $30 a tonne of uh, CO2, is absolutely fundamental. And that's why one of the elements of the global deal that I was arguing was to try to put, as part of your technology uh, development and uh, deployment, um, in the next seven or eight years, get uh, at least 30 or so um, carbon capture and storage plants working on a commercial scale. Uh, the Australians have three in mind, the UK's got one, there's a joint project uh, in China, but we need to move much faster on demonstrating that this works on a commercial scale. And I think the Chinese would be very interested then if we could show that. Uh, when you go into discussions with them privately, not yet in public, but privately they say, look, we understand the dangers that we are in 
as China. Um, you know, the Yangtze and the Yellow River rise in the Him Himalayas, and they're very sensitive to uh, the disruption of those flows. And the glaciers in the Himalayas are already retreated by 15% in the last 40 years. You know, they understand the vulnerability of Shanghai and other cities to sea level rise. They actually see the point. Um, so they're looking for the finance and they're looking for uh, the technologies. And I think that uh, that's why I describe the global deal or the global framework in the way that uh, I did. Because if it does get going, I think uh, China would come in. But it's going to take uh, concrete demonstration of those two things, flows of finance and sharing of technology. Wait for the mic. Wait, wait for the mic. I was wondering if you could hit the highlights on contrasting the United States with Europe with regard to our per capita um, carbon uh, footprint. In particular, what is it about us that makes us different? Is it the, the, the nature of our, our capital stock, the age of the capital stock, or how we live, or how far apart we live from each other, the size of our homes? Why such a big difference? Uh, there are lots of people on the, uh, here that, who know the details of it much uh, more than I do. Um, you've had low prices. Just take transport. You know, you've had half the price of... Uh, um, petrol, I mean gasoline, in the United States relative to, say, Europe uh, for a, uh, a very long time. And uh, the uh, consumption, petrol consumption of cars is uh, much higher. The um, United States is probably pretty uh, energy inefficient relative to at least some parts of uh, Europe. A lot of northern Europe is actually really quite um, energy efficient. Um, partly to do with the, um, the higher price of energy. So one part of the story, I think, is the uh, energy story. Um, living further apart, of course, makes it difficult because that means that uh, you will have um, more transport. So there's some structural reasons, it seems to me, and some policy reasons. And the uh, United States is a very creative, uh, powerful place, and if it chooses to get much more energy efficient, either through prices or through regulation or some combination of them, or through um, trading schemes, um, for example, through the Northeastern Electricity Authorities, it could actually move very fast, it seems to me, in, um, in bringing that down if it chooses to. And it does seem to me from current discussions that it's quite likely that it, uh, it will choose to do it. But I wouldn't want to say there's something inevitable about the structure of the United States or the history of the United States, which means that it has to be so high. I think it's a matter of choice, actually. I, it's getting rather late, and I'm unfortunately going to have to cut this off. Please join me in thanking Lord Stern. Thank you.